And this is Bob Dylan Revisited, looking back at every song in the Bob Dylan discography. Today's song, An Auspicious Occasion, An Auspicious Day, An Auspicious Anniversary. Folks, it's Mississippi. Released 2001, September 11th. Today, 22 years ago, on Love and Theft. Mississippi is, well, there's no use in keeping you on your toes. It's the best Bob Dylan song now, forever, always. Just check any version of the Jokerman 100. A major work that Bob was aware was a major work of his own from the very beginning. Just check all of the zillion different versions that we've seen of this song from Telltale Signs to Fragments to, of course, the actual canonical version here on the record. Seriously, in, in addition to the, you know, the, the Love and Theft cut, we now have no less than five official, unofficial cutting room floor versions of Mississippi dating all the way back to 1996, half a decade before the song would actually see the light of day. And it's really remarkable how, like, put together and complete most of those early takes sound. The lyric is almost entirely there. Melody, delivery, pretty similar to what we're gonna end up seeing for the first time on the morning of September 11th, 2001, the only interesting thing happening that day, if, I, if my memory serves. But to Bob's credit, none of those early takes did it for him. They didn't have it, 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 whatever it may have been. You know, maybe it was the players. The Time Out of Mind work, and that's where these initial versions of Mississippi came from, that work was notoriously difficult, right? You had a revolving cast of musicians at a series of different studios across the country, from Oxnard, California, to Miami, Florida. Goes without saying, not how Bob Dylan wants to make an album, right? He wants to have a crack team of players locked in on like a subterranean, submental level, just the guys that he plays with night after night in the room together, ready to go, able to cut these takes in the studio with eyes closed and ear, like if they didn't, if their ears were cut, if they were all Vincent Van Gogh, they didn't have any ears, they'd still be able to do it. That's what a Bob Dylan recording session is all about. Maybe it wasn't the players, maybe it was, you know, Daniel Lanois, uh, to, come, to, to come back to him once again. Uh, the guy's one of the greatest producers in the history of rock music, but he's almost like a, you know, in, in the Bob Dylan psycho community, he's like a whipping boy at this point. Uh, any failing from any session that he was involved in can be laid at his feet, chalked up to his inability, Daniel's inability to work with Bob the way that Bob wants to work with. That's not to say that the way that Bob wants to work is the way to work. You know, it's it's kind of a, a weird way to do it. I know I have my preferences with the Time Out of Mind material and its presentation. By and large, honestly, I think they got it right the first time. Daniel Anwar was an absolute, like, essential member of that whole production. The record would not be nearly as fondly remembered or successful if he hadn't been there to swamp it up. And the recent remix that we saw on Fragments, you know, does two things. One, it testifies to a Bob's ongoing disappointment and disillusionment with that whole sound and project. And B, it burnishes Daniel's reputation. I mean, it, it makes it very clear. The songs like Standing in the Doorway, Cold Irons Bound, Not Dark Yet, like they need, they need that sound. As for Mississippi, you know, none of the alternate takes sound quite right. The new ones on Fragments are, I think we got two more uh, on the latest bootleg series release. They're fun listens, but ultimately it's it's too casual of a presentation for a song this big, this weighty, this historic, earth-shaking. And then on the Telltale Sign releases, you know, we've had those for 15 years at this point. You know, a lot of that's a little too austere as far as I'm concerned. Mississippi is many things. In some senses, it's everything. But... The thing it is above all else, to me, is just a fucking great rock song. Just an immaculate chorus of electric and acoustic guitars and ramshackle rhythm and beautiful, crystal clear American music. And that's not what you get on those Telltale Signs presentations, which are cleared out, stripped down, acoustic, overly serious in, in some ways. A lot of folks prefer those stripped down takes, and who am I to say they're wrong? But, um, well, you know what? Fuck it. <laughs> this is my video. You are wrong. If you love rock songs, you gotta love the Love and Theft take of Mississippi. That's the one. And maybe it wasn't even Daniel Lanois. Maybe it was Bob himself that was the reason that those earlier takes didn't take. The lyric doesn't really fit very neatly alongside the other things that he was writing at this time. It's too bright-eyed and bushy-tailed to sit there next to the world-weary, world-ending stakes of Not Dark Yet and Doorway. But at the same time, it's 
so much more than like a simple blues shuffle, which is the other half of Time Out of Mind, right? Slotting Mississippi alongside like Million Miles or Till I Fell in Love With You, that does this song a disservice. It sounds and feels more like those numbers than You're Not Dark Yet, than Your Love Six, and so on. But there's so much more going on here, both at the surface and beneath it. The closest thing to the obsessions that I really see is something like Red River Shore, right? Which was notoriously another song captured and really perfected during the Time Out of Mind sessions that Bob decided not to include on the record. Just wasn't, wasn't part of the project, wasn't the vibe. Maybe Bob Dylan just needed to wait until Mississippi made sense in the world into which it was being released. A world in which the sky really was full of fire. Pain really was pouring down. You know, I did, I did uh, put quite a bit of research into the critical legacy of Love and Theft last year in preparation for a 33 and a third pitch that obviously was not accepted. And looking in at all of the critical takes from that time, it's really, it was unmistakable. There are those that were written before the release day, September 11th, and there are those written after. Totally different types of writing, totally different types of worlds in which they were being written, right? You could just write about the music and the record and Bob Dylan making a nice album in his golden years if you were doing it before. Grill Marcus has a great review from an early edition of the New York Times, you know, a week or so before it came out. But if you were coming to this record on its release day or after, it was, it was so much more. It had to be so much more. And that was the only way to write about it and think about it. Greg Tate, in the September 25th edition of The Village Voice, wrote really the definitive one of these takes. You know, the, looking at love and theft as part of 9-11, as big a part as the fucking plane setting the Pentagon and the World Trade Centers. There are too many bonkers lines to quote them all. You just got to search it out for yourself. Seriously, just Google Greg Tate, Village Voice, September 25th, love and theft. But this one in particular sums up the whole kind of vibe, right? I'm, and quoting here directly, so many prescient, portentous lyrics on Love and Theft beg the question, what did Dylan know and when did he know it? Some up-to-the-minute somebody at the Federal Bureau of Immigration will surely wish to inquire about the former Mr. Zimmerman's connection to Osama bin Laden. I don't think this guy actually heard <laughs> Bob Dylan as part of Al-Qaeda. Um, but at the same time, he's got his name in a sentence right there next to Osama bin Laden. The connections are just, he's, he's flying all over the place. The world is flying all over the place. And, I mean, you think about it, it really was an irresistible angle, right? Like, here is the great American artist of the 20th century, back for the first time in the 21st century. We're in the new century, we're in the new millennium. 21st, the 2000s are here, baby. Just as America itself seems to be crumbling. We are definitively out of the American century and into whatever this new one is, the opposite of the American century, the anti-American century in many regards. We couldn't trust ourselves. We couldn't trust our government. We couldn't trust our security agencies. We obviously couldn't trust anyone outside of this country because they fucking hated us because why wouldn't they? But we could trust Bob fucking Dylan, the man that was everything, the nation itself once was, still might have wanted to be, but certainly no longer was. And so Love and Theft became inextricable from its release date, right? A phantasmic escapist vision of an alternate dimension America where the towers were still standing strong and our hearts were not weary, but rather light and free. So that's, you know, that's the story behind Mississippi. It's irresistible even now. But so is the song itself, even divorced of all of the world historic context. It's five and a half minutes, side one, track two of Love and Theft, the perfect follow-on from Tweedly Dee and Tweedly Dumb, one of the all-time great album openers. Bob sounds gruff, tougher than he last sounded when we saw him on Time Out of Mind, but he's also, he's totally at ease at this point. There's this unmistakable sense, feeling of like serendipity, of serenity, of everything aligning pieces in their right places from top to bottom. You got Charlie on the guitar, Tony and David Kemper keeping time, and that signature infectious mandolin lick from Larry Campbell that was missing on so many of those earlier versions. You know, you might like one or the other or any of the alternate takes from Tomb, but I swear, put them up against this take, and they are all just instantly invalidated, made obsolete, just like that. It's the same thing as, like, Donald Fagan and Walter Becker piecing together Peg during the Asia sessions. You know, you see that, like, during the classic albums documentary, which we've talked about recently. You know, it, there's that Jay Graydon guitar solo that they are so focused in on, the, 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 the guitar solo in Peg. They hear it, and it's immediate and self-evident and obvious. Like, that's it. 
that's what this song is supposed to be. And that is the exact way that I feel about Mississippi, the Love and Theft version. You know, you've got that, that signature Love and Theft sound here, just a crystal clear classical presentation, courtesy of Chris Shaw, recording engineer, and one Mr. Jack Frost, who from here on out would take over solo producing duties for every Bob Dylan release. Who Jack Frost is, it's a matter of mystery. We're still looking for photographs of the man, just like Dick Dene. You know, it sounds like a crisp fall morning, a hot hearth, the smoothest glass of bourbon of your life. It's effortlessly essential American music. So you've got the sound, a great sound, as good, the perfect sound, as good as anything has ever sounded, as far as I'm concerned. And then there's the lyric, a heavy, heady journey through the Mississippi of Bob Dylan's mind. Loaded with symbolism, you can pull basically anything you want out of any one word. And at the same time, it's, it's pretty simple. It's told in straightforward language, words we can all understand. It's as much or as little as we want it to be. In other words, a shapeshifter of a song. It can be a love song. Every step of the way we walk the line. Your days are numbered, so are mine. It can be a lost love song, for that matter. Some people will offer you their hand and some won't. Last night I knew you, tonight I don't. It can be a literal song based on personal experience. I was raised in the country. I've been working in the town. I've been in trouble ever since I set my suitcase down. That is Bob Dylan's story to a T. Or it can be the complete opposite. It can be a total allegory. My ship's been split to splinters and it's sinking fast. I'm drowning in poison. Got no future, got no past. And of course, the refrain. One of the greatest in Bob's entire catalog. Only one thing I did wrong stayed in Mississippi a day too long. Such a weighty statement. You know, it's, it's haunted by centuries of hate and hysteria, and yet such simple language, something for the man on the street. And that's what makes Mississippi the greatest Bob Dylan song and my favorite Bob Dylan song. The one I keep coming back to, the one I will never ever get tired of. If I've gotta be on a fucking desert island with a single one of these tunes, I know which one I'm picking every time. More than anything else in the man's discography, it is generous. It gives and gives and just goes right on giving. And as for America, that broke old bastard everyone saw in this song, through all the leaves fallen from the trees, through all the pain pouring down on that fateful morning, you know what they say, you can always come back but you can't come back all the way. Mississippi, three stars.